absolutely delighted to welcome to this third round of Global Conversations, The View from 30,000 Feet, the noted speaker, uh, author, artist, educator, Teresa Ruth Howard of Memoirs of Blacks in Valley. Teresa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. So tell us a little bit about you. Tell us a lot about you. Well, you know, um, I'm from Philadelphia originally. I don't usually say that out loud. <laughs> Um, and as a dancer, I trained at Pennsylvania Ballet under Lupe Serrano. Um, I danced with Dancing of Harlem. I actually danced with uh, Kara Armitage, Donald Byrd. Um, and, and my life kind of takes these interesting twists and turns. And, and I started teaching as I was dancing and writing as I was dancing and teaching. Um, so um, I have sort of had this incredible sort of mishmash of um, experience in the dance world that makes me, I think, that prepared me for the work that I'm doing um, presently in diversity um, and helping to diversify uh, ballet specifically. So tell us, um, you founded Memoirs of Blacks in Ballet. Uh, tell us when you founded it, was there a particular precipitating incident or you, or you were just like, you know what, I've had it and I've got to do something in this <laughs> It, the year was 2015. And um, yeah, I, I wrote an article um, that, that took to task the narrative and the mythology of Misty Copeland being the first and the only Black ballerina. Um, and um, in the comments, I, I put, you know, if you're a Black ballerina or if you know of a Black ballerina, um, put your name or their name in the comments so that we can make the invisible visible. Because I felt like the, um, the history of Blacks in ballet uh, was being like eradicated, right? There was an erasure happening and, and, and like this collective amnesia was happening. And coming out of, you know, I danced for Dance of Harlem. So I danced with a whole bunch of Black ballerinas. So for me, I was very personal. Um, and the outpouring was what ended up becoming the roll call. So like people were just putting names and there were, there were great conversations and dropping links. And I said, this has to live somewhere. So originally I, I named it Museum of Blacks and Ballet, but in, in New York, the word museum is regulated. So I had to like quickly think on my feet and I was like, okay, memoir, what's another M? So it became Memoirs of Blacks and Ballet. Um, and Really, it, it, initially, it really was a place where um, I could kind of curate, like keep, preserve the history, but also curate the, the, the narrative that was happening now. And I think that, that that's what I tried to do. And later, the advocacy part came as people became aware of the conversation that had, that had started around the idea of like, oh, yeah, there are all these other Black ballet dancers. Yeah, I, I totally hear you. We stole your idea a little bit, I think. You know, we have a master list of uh, women leaders, to which we've just, by the way, started adding film editors and film producers because oh. there's so many things going virtual. Film is now becoming a, a new subspecialization. But I, I often describe it as uh, the somebody taking a brush to the path behind and sweeping it clear mm -hmm and particularly sleep, sweeping eight clear of women in color. So uh, I think it's a wonderful idea. So obviously some important and long awaited discussions are happening now with regard to diversifying ballet. You are playing a major role, if not the leading role in doing that. Um, big question here, do you feel change is coming at the right time? I think we're always evolving. It's always changing, right? I think that historically we've had, you know, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Act, like that we've, we're always constantly changing. The question is, is it sustainable? Is it authentic, right? Um, and so our nation has to evolve in order to survive. Ballet has to evolve in order to survive. But both of those things are, are kind of like self-interested, <laughs> right? It doesn't necessarily have to do so for the right reasons. It's really just survival. So the question of all these changes that are happening is, are we making them because we see the inherent benefit 
um, of diversity and includes it, that it creates richness, that it is, it, we are inherently better, not just here, like surviving, relevant is the word that's used a lot, um, but is it, a, is it necessary um, for the art to, to evolve and be better, right? That's the question. Yeah. And I think that for some people, yes, it's authentic change. And for others, it's just what they need to do to, to, to stay relevant, be on brand, right? Save the face of the brand that they're responsible for. Um, I think it's as, as individual as individuals. Yeah, I'm, I'm always fascinated. You and I were talking before we started the interview about unconscious bias, Iris Bonet's work from Harvard Kennedy School. And I look at venture capital teams, um, equity management teams, financial advisors, and you know, financial advisors are still 85% male, white, and over the age of 50. And it makes no sense because you're missing massive market share. You're also not connecting with women who by some estimates are gonna own two thirds of the wealth in 2040. And yet it continues. And I, I sometimes wonder if ballet just wants to drive itself off a cliff, right? Uh, it's, it's why, why are decisions continually being made that exclude a huge potential audience, right? Um, why are the stories not being told? And by the way, a lot of the stories that are being told over and over again are kind of boring. This is an important part of, for me, the work, right? And the evolution is we need to stop asking those questions that we know the answer to. Let's ask a more relevant question. Let's ask a more uh, a challenging question because we know why, right? Like it preserves the people in power that, that want to be, that want to remain in power. There, we, we understand the why. Um, we just have to figure out the way to, um, well, dismantle that, right? Oh boy, I could not agree with you more on that. So you obviously don't have to say any names unless you want to, but are there companies or initiatives out there that you think could be doing better? And what does better look like? The work that organizations do has to be specific to their demographics, their budget, the communities they serve, um, and their specific organizational culture, right? So that, that's where I get down maybe on the granule level of, of what, that, what good work looks like. And for me, shifts don't have to be huge, right? There can be small shifts in, in um, procedures or behavior that sort of start a cascade of other changes. There are different things that, that companies can be doing that aren't necessarily the big bang outward facing things. It's more human shifts about the lens shifts so that Everybody from your development officer to your comms director to your, the, the chairman of your board is sharing the same lens about the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, I remember having a conversation um, uh, at, at a meeting and the chairman of the board was there and I was pushing for more women choreographers and he said, yes, but, but what will happen to the quality? And it just leaked out of him and his minder who was with him, um, you could tell this person's face went white. And I just sort of looked at this person and I was just like, okay, where do we start? Um, the idea that, to your point, the idea that more diversity, equity, inclusion means the company is going to be less artistically successful, not just financially, but art less artistically mm -hmm. successful is really insidious and terrifying to me. I mean, I remember it happens less. This statement was the go-to statement about diversity, but we have a standard. And I would listen to it like early, like I would listen to it and, and I would be personally, I would be offended, but it took me a while to put in, into a statement. I don't know why, I, I was like, that is inherently racist because you're, the implication is that somehow black people are never going to be at the standard. And then after I put it in the, those words, less and less that became the excuse for the reasons why they're not, right? So what does that 
statement even mean? I mean, what the heck? What what does that even mean? Who gets to design this? I'm sorry. Now I'm going to go off. But well, you know who gets to design it. We already know the question. But but here's 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 what for me the work that I do. Like if I were you sitting in there, I would offer. Like someone says, oh, but you know, more women means a lower standard. All stop. Let's open that up. So let's open the, in, the implicit bias, right? That, that is deeply embedded in that, in that statement. Um, and then that's the discussion because I don't think that people actually, that's, it's implicit for a reason. So how do you define a successful ballet company? And you can, you can take this wherever you want. This is a hard question to answer because I don't want to put anything on anybody because I think that every company needs to self-identify. Okay. Right? Like that's important that, that, that whether it's, it's Pacific Northwest ballet or whether it's Ukukumuka ballet, they need to decide for themselves what their identity is. And if they are serving whatever that is, then that might be a level of success. So you can, you can choose whatever you want, right? But be authentic and rooted in it. But if you choose to be diverse, right? If you choose to be welcoming and belonging, then those qualities come, they feel like something, they look like something. So if that's what you wanna be, then we should expect to see, you know, multi-ethnic, multi-racial um, dancers and employees in your organization and on your board, in your audience, right? in your repertory as choreographers, right? On your production staff, that's what we should expect to see. Yep. To a degree, because then demographics have everything to do with it too, right? So it's, 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 it's complex. I love that answer though, because it's not the sort of, well, um, the one that we see so much, well, we do Swan Lake and we do, you know, Jewels and we look as much like San Francisco Ballet or New York City Ballet as possible. And then we show that to each other over the heads of the audiences by programming that and say, look, we just did it. Um, I talk a lot about the fact that with um, the reduction, almost one might argue the death or the simultaneous crisis of the journalist, of journalism, dance journalism and the newspapers going away, um, there's less and less coverage regionally. And a lot of smaller companies, their voices get lost unless they get plucked to appear at say the Joyce Theater where they do great work, but you can only have so many ballet companies in a year. I think that journal, dance journalism is, is problematic, right? Like again, that bubble inside the bubble is that it generally goes to bright, shiny things um, and things that it recognizes or that everybody else is recognizing instead of really being on the forefront of like investigating and um, lifting up these things that we maybe we should know about. But I will say that I think that the internet, right, will be the answer. People are getting information from so many different places, yeah. right? So it's just a matter of really being connected with these other entities, these smaller entities that actually might have reaches into communities and into to people's homes that you would never think would be connected with you. You're, you're saying what I'm thinking, which is that this is a time of possibility in this way because every, it's democratizing. Everybody's kind of on the same level. It's the old system of you have to be reviewed by one of these, what, four or five papers favorably for then funders and presenters to want to bring you. Yep, that's a value system. Right. And it's and it's it's rigged and it's tiered. I think that it would be great if journalists really stepped outside of their comfort zones to a degree and looked at some things that that, you know, they wouldn't normally look at. Um, but then I think also there's a, a personal responsibility, you know, of of us as audience members kind of being, you know, curious. I remember getting all the pamphlets for the different companies for their seasons. And like everybody was doing Sleeping Beauty. 
at the same time, like everybody's doing Capalia. Like who wants to see the same, like, I'm like, what's going on? Like what happened to the individuality, right? And the distinctness of companies, right? So that, 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 that maybe if everybody wasn't doing the same thing, then maybe we could have diversity in bodies, right? You know, that's why companies that have, that are led by choreographers or founded by choreographers are, are oftentimes so interesting, right? Because that choreographer is, is looking for something that, that they are interested in working with, certain yeah. attributes. I have one more question for you. This is supposed to be the fun one. And I'll, okay. kind of, I'll do it in two ways. Um, do you still dream about ballet every once in a while? And are you in the audience or are you dancing? Do you dream about it? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I don't dream of the movement. No. I'm usually um, terrorized and plagued no. by trying to solve the problems of it. Like literally. Like I wake up thinking about what I can do to shift this, that, or the other. What was the last performance that completely consumed you? Um, when I am, when something is that good, the hair on, on my arm stands up on the back of my neck. I mean, I, I, I don't even think I'm breathing. My whole body is in the performance. When was the last time something like that happened to you? It was Dada Masilo's uh, Giselle huh. at the Joyce. What she did with, with her Giselle, was transformative and when I, I literally everybody it was at the Joyce Theater that I saw it and before the curtain hit the 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 stage people were on their feet she transformed that ballet right because it's really just a story a love story right I'm a quite a love um she contextualized it in a South African village. She reimagined it in a way that was completely plausible. She did not use the classical score, but it was Giselle. And when the curtain job, I, when I was watching it, I was like, yes, yes, and yes. This is what ballet needs to be thinking. This is how it needs to be thinking, right? Um, and it just, because my mind was in that, that how do how do we move ballet forward? How do we help it evolve? Um, and that was that was before Akram Khan did his version, and I haven't seen that. The last time that happened for me was Akram Khan's. Oh. Well, you have been incredibly, extraordinarily generous with your time. You know, I know how I know how hard you work and have been working, but even if there were twenty eight hours in the day, you can't solve all the world's problems. You ha I think you kind of have to pick you know, what you go after and what you try and get done, right? True, true. And apparently I've picked ballet or ballet has picked me. It's picked you. <laughs> anyway, Teresa Ruth Howard, thank you so, so much. One of the most interesting, thought-provoking conversations I've had in a very long time. Oh. A very necessary conversation. And I learned a ton. So thank you very, very thank much. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you do as well. <sighs> I know. <laughs> Libra sisters. <laughs> sisters in Libra.